Welcome to the lecture on the Progressive Era. This is a period when more Americans turn to federal and state governments to provide solutions to what they see as the social and economic problems that come with industrial capitalism. It's such a big turning point in American history because it changes American politics. Thus far, when Americans, especially white Americans, thought about the biggest threat to their liberty and freedom, it was a powerful centralized government. But the rise of industrial capitalism pushed many Americans to see large corporations suddenly as, a, as the most dangerous threat to their liberty and freedom. And they saw a more powerful government as a tool to protect those liberties from corporations. It's the start of a division in American politics that we still live with today. And if you think about the divisions in our contemporary politics, what often divides us is whether we think corporate power or government power is a bigger threat to our liberties. So for the purpose of this lecture, let's try to make sense of all of these progressive era initiatives that you've read about and divide them into two categories. Efforts to control the power of big business and efforts to change other people. The fight to control the power of uh, big business is probably pretty obvious. Right? By the fight to change other people, I'm talking about the moral reform of the period, the idea that industrializ industrialization had created many vices that the government needed to, to restrict. This included a broad range of things from prostitution to drinking alcohol. So first, let's try to figure out why Americans would see industrial capitalism and the rise of large corporations as a threat. Think about how industrial capitalism is changing the nature of manufacturing work. Your textbook lays out Frederick Taylor's management techniques and the principles of scientific management that begin to change how people work. Companies took every step to become more efficient. By the 1890s, corporations embraced new forms of management techniques in the workplace, often referred to as scientific management. When companies applied these, uh, techniques and started to sub, uh, they started to subdivide manufacturing into small tasks. Mass production required workers to repeat the same standardized operation all day, every day. One investigator found that a worker became, quote, a mere machine. Take the proposition of a man operating a machine to nail on 40 to 60 cases of heels in a day. That is 2,400 pairs, 4,800 shoes in a day. One not accustomed to it would wonder how a man could pick up and lay down 4,800 shoes in a day to say nothing uh, of putting them into a, a machine. That is the driving method of a manufacturer of shoes under these minute conditions, end quote. So compared to manufacturing work in small shops where workers had closer relationships with owners, had a bit more control over hours, and manufactured entire products, not just a small piece of a product, this was a radical change. Workers believed this new type of manufacturing labor was taking away their independence. They could no longer decide when to begin and end the workday, when to rest, uh, and what tools and techniques to use. The clock regulated them. One manufacturer, uh, one Massachusetts factory labor testified in 1879, quote, during worker working hours, the men are not allowed to speak to each other, uh, though working close together on pain of instant discharge. Men are hired to watch and patrol the shop, end quote. Many workers liken this new work to slavery. The work required in these new industries was incredibly dangerous. Uh, your textbook tells the famous story of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. That's one example that illustrates a larger story about how dangerous working conditions, um, unregulated by any government agency. In the railroad industry, 72,000 employees were killed on tracks between 1890 and 1917, and close to 2 million were injured. Another 158,000 were killed in repair shops and roundhouses. Industrial capitalism also produced unprecedented wealth for people who owned corporations but held workers in poverty. In the 1880s, about 45% of industrial laborers barely held above the $500 per year poverty line. About 40% lived below the line of tolerable existence. About a quarter of those living below uh, the poverty line actually lived in destitution. 
15%, a small group of highly skilled workers capable of earning, uh, were capable of earning from $800 to $1,100 per year. And industrial capitalism hit small farmers especially hard, competing with companies uh, with economy of scale and high railroad prices made it difficult for farmers to compete in the marketplace. Americans also saw, saw corporations as a threat to democracy. The election to start, that started to give legs to raise serious concerns about corporate power was the election of 1896. Republican William Kinley's campaign manager, Mark Hanna, transformed what an election looks like. Hanna's successful solicitation of corporations to fund uh, the campaign marked an end of the Republican Party's reliance on small individual campaign contributions. As a result, McKinley's campaign contributions from corporate interests, bankers, businessmen, life insurance companies, and other employers amounted to $7 million. That doesn't count the sum of smaller individual contributions that didn't represent business interests. On the other end, William Jennings Bryant was able to raise somewhere between $300,000 to $600,000. And that disparity meant that Hannah was able to set up offices for McKinley's campaign in New York and Chicago in close proximity to undecided states. Hannah paid for organized trainloads of voters to travel to meet McKinley on the front porch of his Ohio home. And where that was impractical, he paid for the travel expenses of over 1,400 campaigners to travel to the hinterlands of the United States to organize votes for McKinley. The campaign also shipped out over 120 million campaign documents, many of which misrepresented his opponent, William Jennings Bryant's views. On the other side, William Jennings Bryant's campaign um, relied on stump speeches. Right. Brian traveled 18,099 miles by train, stopping in communities across the country to give stump speeches. And corporate influence in elections didn't stop in 1896. A congressional investigation revealed that when Theodore Roosevelt ran for president in 1904, 73,000 of all his campaign contributions came from corporations. So this scared a lot of people who were worried about um, what they thought of as the ideal model of American campaigning that featured persuasive speeches, political lectures, um, publication of articles and speeches, and reason appeals that avoided public passion or prejudice was threatened by this new model where the fortunes of candidates' campaigns were tied to how much money that com campaign could raise. And finally, Americans began to see industrial capitalism as a threat to consumers. Companies could put anything in their products without any oversight. Revelations about what was going on in Americans' food started to raise concerns. And so I'm going to um, read a short excerpt from one of the most famous books of the period, Upton, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, which revealed the horrors of the meatpacking industry and eventually led to federal legislation. So this is a, a, an excerpt from his book. It seemed as if every time you met a person from a new department, you heard the swindles of new crimes. There was, for instance, a Lithuanian who was a cattle butcher for the plant, which killed meat for canning only. And to hear this man describe the animals which came uh, to his place would have been worthwhile for Dante or Azola. It seemed that they must have agencies all over the country to hunt out old and crippled and diseased cattle to be canned. There were cattle to which uh, had been fed on whiskey malt, the refuse of breweries. It had become what the men called steerly, which means covered in boils. It was the nasty job. It was a nasty job killing these. For when you plunged your knife into them, they would burst and splash foul smelling stuff in your face. And when a man's sleeves were smeared with blood and his hands steeped in it, how was he ever to wipe his face or clear his eyes so that he could see? It was stuff such as this that made the embalmed beef that had killed several times as many United States soldiers as all the bullets of the Spaniards. Only the army beef besides was not fresh canned. It was old stuff that had been lying around uh, for years in the cellars. There was another interesting set of statistics that a person might have gathered in Packingtown. Those are the various afflicted, afflictions of the workers. There were the men in the pickle rooms, scarce a one of these that had not uh, some spot of horror on his person. 
Let a man so much as scrape his finger pushing a truck in the pickle rooms. I mean, he might have a sore that would put him out of the world. All the joints in his fingers might be eaten by acid, one by one. Of the butchers and floorsmen, the beef boners and trimmers, and all those who use knives, you could scarcely find a person who had the use of his thumb. There were the, there were the wool pluckers, whose hands went to pieces even sooner than the hands of the pickle men. For the pelts of the sheep had to be painted with acid to loosen the wool. And then the pluckers had to pull out this wool with their bare hands, till the acid had eaten their fingers off. Worst of any, however, were the fertilizer men, and those who served in the cooking rooms. These men could not be shown to the visitor, for the odor of a fertilizer man would scare any ordinary visitor at a hundred yards. And as for those men who worked in the tank rooms full of steam, and in some of which uh, there were open vats near the level of the floor, their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the vats. And when they were fished out, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone into the world as Durham's pure beef lard. The irony here, actually, is that Upton Sinclair wrote this book to reveal the awful working conditions, but instead the public actually focused on the descriptions of the food uh, they were consuming. So instead of this book sparking reforms um, concerning the hazardous conditions workers labored in, this book actually helped spark the Pure Food and Drug Act. Right? And Sinclair later wrote, quote, I aimed at the public's heart and by accident hit his stomach. So this is, is the environment where Americans began to see corporations as a great threat to American liberty and look to the state and local government to control the power of corporations. Your textbook reading does a good job summarizing the organizations and uprisings of the period. And I'm not going to repeat those here, but I want to give you a sense of just the radical visions that came out of this period. I want to read um, from some of the documents these groups produced. So pay attention um, to how they describe corporations in the world that they wanted to create. And so what, what I'm about to read is from a document produced by the Knights of Labor in 1878. And here's the preamble to the document. Quote, the recent alarming development and aggression of aggregated wealth, which unless unchecked, will inevitably lead to the pauperization and hopeless degradation of the toiling masses, render it imperative if we desire to enjoy the blessings of life that a check should be placed upon its power and upon unjust accumulation. And so here are the things that, that, that they were actually calling for. The enactment of laws to compel chartered corporations to pay their employees weekly, in full, for labor performed during the preceding week. In a lawful money of the country. The prohibition of the employment of children in workshops, mines, and factories before attaining their 14th year. To abolish the system of letting out by contract the labor of convicts in our prisons and reformatory institutions. Remember, this is about convict leasing system that we discussed um, in the Reconstruction Lecture. To secure for both sexes equal pay for equal work. The reduction of hours of labor to eight hours per day so that the laborers may have more time to enjoy uh, for social enjoyment and intellectual improvement and be enabled to reap the advantages confirmed, uh, conferred by labor saving uh, machinery which their brains have created. And so this was a group that by 1886 had a membership of 730,000 people. And so here's one more document. Um, this is from the Omaha platform, which launched the Populist Party in 1892. And your textbook gives good background on the Populist Party, but I want to give you a sense of what they were writing about capitalism. So here's uh, some of the document. The fruits of the toil of millions are boldly stolen to build up colossal fortunes for a few, unprecedented in the history of mankind. And the possessors of those, in turn, despise the republic and endanger liberty. From, a, from the same prolific womb of government injustice, we breed two great classes, tramps and millionaires. 
We believe that the power of government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify. To end that oppression, injustice, and poverty shall eventually cease in this land. And so here are some of the things that they're calling for in this document. Um, and you can see here the importance of farmers um, and their conflicts with railroad companies. So they say, we believe uh, that the time has come when the railroad corporations will either own the people or the people must own the railroads. And should the government enter upon the work of owning and managing all railroads, we should favor an amendment to the Constitution by which all persons engaged in the government service shall be placed under a civil service regulation of the most rigid character so as to prevent the increase of power of the national administration by the use of such additional government employees. They say we demand a graduated income tax. Transportation being the means of exchange and a public necessity, the government should own and operate the railroads in the interest of the people. The telegraph, telephone, like the post office system, being a necessity for the transmission of news, should be owned and operated by the government in the interest of the people. The land, including all the natural sources of wealth, is the heritage of the people and should not be monopolized for speculative purposes, and alien ownership of land should be prohibited. All land now held by railroads and other corporations in excess of their actual needs, and all lands now owned by aliens should be reclaimed by the government and held for actual settlers only. So wage workers and farmers are making really some serious claims about industrial capitalism during this period. And they're calling on the federal government to expand its power from regulation to even complete government ownership. But at the time, it really wasn't clear, right, whether the federal government would be a great ally for some of these workers and farmers. The federal government was, um, at this time, really a strong ally of corporations. High school teachers like to talk about um, laissez-faire as if it reflected reality. And remember uh, from your high school teachings that laissez-faire refers to the government's hands-off approach to the economy. Right? Laissez-faire is an idea. At no time in American history has there ever been a free market in the United States where the federal government played no role. In the late 19th century is no exception. Railroad companies were the first major corporation in the United States, and they were heavily subsidized by the federal government. Right? I mean, the federal government granted railroad corporations over 180 million acres, mostly for interstate routes. And these grants usually consisted of right away plus alternate sections of land in a strip of uh, 20 to 80 miles wide along um, the right away. And the railroad companies turned around and funded construction by using this land as security for bonds or by selling it for cash. And the government also supported corporations by suppressing labor dissent. Armories are, are the most visible ex examples of this suppression, unlike arm armories built in years past, set down in places not well regulated by law enforcement, armories in the late 19th century were built in places where the government anticipated labor strikes. Many were built in urban areas. Federal and state courts, courts also stepped in to support corporations. So between 1880 and 1930, courts issued 4,300 injunctions against unions. The Supreme Court also expanded the power of corporations. Right? In 1873, the famous slaughterhouse cases, um, the Supreme Court interpreted the 14th Amendment to not only protect free people, but also protect Americans against what they called unreasonable regulation and molestation. Further, in 1886, the Supreme Court transformed corporations into legal persons, giving them the protections originally conceived for free people, right? former slaves. So when we look at the actual reform that un unfolded during this period, as usually happens, right? the workers and farmers aren't the ones who actually make the reform or control reform. They created the grassroots pressure through strikes and disruptions, um, but the actual reform comes through an emerging middle class um, that formed during this period that we call the progressives. 
These were the small proprietors and professionals, clerks and salespeople, managers and bureaucrats and their families. They were the growing professional and managerial class that increased dramatically as the result of industrial capitalism. Many of these people had lost their businesses and were suddenly dependent on corporations for wages too. And they were also what historians call uh, Victorians, people who privileged thrift and warned against extravagance. They promoted individualism, but with a hefty uh, hand of self-restraint. And this middle class of this period were troubled by both the working class and the upper class. They were troubled by the greed of industrialists, the, the large mansions and extravagant wealth that they flaunted. And they were also troubled by the violence of labor strikes. Right? They were troubled by the extreme poverty that came with industrial capitalism, but they also weren't willing to make the types of critiques and call for the types of reforms that we just saw with the Knights of Labor and the populists. And so progressives were thinking about creating some sort of middle ground between you know, intense individualism and socialism upon which to remake society. Many of the most prominent progressives started to use the word association to describe this new ideal that would provide an alternative to individualism. And for historians, when people start using new words, right, it's exciting for us. Whether we like their new visions or not, it's a signal to us that something big is going on and people are trying to view the world a bit differently. The famous progressive Jane Addams talked about the world in this right way. She said, um, we are passing from an age of individualism to one of association. We must demand that the individual shall be willing to lose the sense of personal achievement and shall be content to realize his activity only in connect connection with the activity of many. Other progressives often talked about association as creating a new world based on corporation or cooperation rather than individualism. And we can see progressives' vision in the moderate reform um, that try to tame capitalism. Most of this reform is in your textbook. So rather than summarize the character of this reform, I want to point out really what is essential to organize all of this information for you. Right, think about the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Northern Securities cases as both addressing monopolies and the danger of corporations that stymied competition. Think about the Pure Food and Drug Act reacting to the problems I mentioned earlier about the products that consumers were buying. Another thing we, thing we talked about is the, the kind of perceived threat of corporations to democracy, right? Some of this isn't in your textbook, so I'll talk about these reforms in a bit more detail. Congress passed a series of acts that were meant to tame the power of corporations in elections. One is the 1907 Tillman Act, which prohibited direct com uh, contributions from corporations and businesses to political parties and election committees. The other is the 1910 Publicity Act, which required full disclosure of all money spent and contributed during federal campaigns so the public could see who was actually contributing to campaigns. Okay, so let's transition now. Let's talk about a different concern among progressives. And this is the theme I mentioned early in the lecture about the fight to change other people. Industrial capitalism unleashed all sorts of concerns among the middle class about the character of the working class. Drinking skyrocketed, prostitution became more visible in urban areas, and divorce race, uh, rates went up. So progressives began to turn to the government to act moral reform legislation. And the most successful of these was prohibition. As you can see in this slide, that per capita consumption of beer and hard liquor was on the rise. Consumption actually doubled between 1885 and 1900, and especially troubling to progressives was that liquor and beer were, be, were more readily available, and people drank in public establishments. You can see the number of businesses that sold liquor also doubled. Right? Americans drank 590 million gallons of beer and other malt liquor in 1885. In 1990, that figure reaches 1.2 billion gallons. Between 1800 and 1900, the number of retail liquor establishments nearly doubled from 150,000 to 250,000. 
And of all the moral issues associated with progressive reform, prohibition invited the most fervor. Two of the most famous organizations that led the charge were the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And when I say fervor, I'm not just talking about some people with signs hanging out in front of saloons. The fight for prohibition brought into history some of America's most interesting characters who were willing to do just about anything to stop alcohol consumption. And to give you a sense of just how far people were willing to go to stop alcohol consumption, I want to read a quick ex excerpt from a great book called The Fierce Discontent. In this part of the book, historian Michael McGurr is talking about a woman named Carrie Nation, and it recounts her efforts to enforce an 1880 amendment to the Kansas Constitution that had outlawed saloons. So here's, here's part of this excerpt. On the morning of June 6, 1900, in the town of Medicine Lodge in southwestern Kansas, Carrie Nation gathered up brickbats and bottles of Schlitz malts. With these smashers loaded in her buggy, she drove nervous and praying to the nearby town of Kiowa. A respectable Christian woman in her 60s known as Mother Nation for her compassion, Carrie Nation was angry nevertheless. Saloons had been outlawed in Kansas since the passage of an amendment to the state constitution in 1880, but the joints and dives still flourished with the condiments of police and local uh, government. Curie Nation was going to Kiowa to do something about that. The next morning, armed with brickbats and bottles, she strode into Mr. Dobson's saloon. She said, I don't want to strike you, she told the proprietor, but I'm going to break up this den of vice. She hurled her smashers at Dobson's liquor bottle. She hurled some more at the mirror behind his bar. Mr. Dobson, she noted with satisfaction, jumped into the corner, seemed very much terrified. Leaving Dobson behind, Kiri Nation attacked three more saloons that morning in Kiowa. Passerby observed, seemed to look puzzled. Dive owners, the town marshal, uh, and the mayor confronted her, but these men were puzzled too. When they decided not to arrest Nation, she stood in her buggy and lifted her hands to the sky. Peace on earth, she called to the people of Kiowa as she rode out of town. Goodwill to men. Her confrontation with the saloon did not end there. Nearly seven months later, only days after Christmas, she went to Wichita with a rod of iron. There she smashed the bar in the Cary Hotel, the finest in town. This mischief there was no puzzlement. She was arrested, tried, uh, found guilty of malicious, uh, of, uh, excuse me, this time there was no puzzlement. She was arrested, tried, found guilty of malicious mischief, and packed off to jail. Her sanity questioned, Nation had to remain there for nearly a month before getting out. Undaunted, she continued her confrontation with the saloon. In Enterprise, a cow town, people threw rotten eggs, beat her, kicked her, and tore her hair. In Topeka, the state capital, she used a hatchet to attack the dives, raised her own, own army of home defenders, and predictably went to jail more than once. So Carrie Nation helped ignite you know, a grassroots movement for prohibition, some with the fervor she represented. And one group that was inspired by Nation actually used a cannon, for example. And at the local and state level, this movement scored many victories in, pro, uh, in prohibiting alcohol consumption, especially in the South and the Midwest. But the biggest victory that comes at the end of the Progressive Era, when the 18th Amendment is ratified uh, in 1919 and went into effect in January 1920. And I'm going to talk more about the consequences of prohibition in a few days. But let's end today by briefly talking about why we don't call the Progressive Era liberalism. And I find that a lot of people make this mistake because they see the policies that try to regulate corporations and see the obvious connection with modern liberalism. But there are a couple of problems, right? First, people living in the period never called this liberalism. In fact, they used liberal in its classical sense. If you, any of you have taken a political philosophy class and have read people like John Locke, you know what I mean here. Classical liberalism feared a large centralized government and saw it as the biggest threat to individual liberty. When we get to the 1930s, we'll talk about how the popular meaning of liberalism shifts. 
But people living in the progressive era would never, call, would never have called progressive reform liberal. The second issue is that progressive reform shows the marks of both what we think of as modern liberalism and modern conservatism. Clearly, efforts to tame capitalism reflect some of the ten tenets of what we think of as modern liberalism. But progressive, uh, the progressives focus on moral reform. Right? The efforts to co control individual behavior, such as drinking and prostitution, looks more like modern conservatism. Moral reform is one of the areas that modern conservatives are really comfortable with um, an intrusive government that restricts individual liberties. Right? So as we move through this course, remember to reserve your references to modern liberalism and modern conservatism until we get to the 1930s.